President and Vice-Chancellor, as public orator, may I present Fiona Fox, a candidate for the honorary degree of Doctor of Science. Ladies and gentlemen, you see before you today one of the major communicators of science in English in the world. However, strangely, Fiona Fox is not a scientist, and she's not even English. Fiona was born to an Irish Catholic family in North Wales. Her A-levels were in Welsh, history, and English and she went on to study journalism at the Polytechnic of Central London. Fiona, Fiona began her career as a press officer for Brook Advisory Centres, a charity providing contraception and abortion advice to teenagers. Just weeks after starting, David Alton, a Liberal MP, introduced a parliamentary bill to reduce the abortion limit from 23 weeks to 18. Given that young people tend to present for late for abortions, Fiona's first job was to make sure that the Brooks' opposition to the bill was heard in the news media. This experience gave her a taste for media relations on newsworthy topics, and she went on to take, uh, take roles in the Equal Opportunity Commission, the National Council for One Parent Families, and the Catholic International Development Charity. Fiona was interested in the great scientific controversies of the day around GM food, the MMR vaccine, which she believed were inaccurately reported in the press. Around this time, Fiona read an article by director of, Ro of the Royal Institution and honorary graduate of the University of Leicester, Professor Susan Greenfield, who proposed the idea of an independent media center to bridge the gap between scientists and journalists. Six months later, Fiona found herself in an interview at the Royal Institution in London in front, in front of eight eminent scientists, including Baroness Greenfield, Philip Campbell, editor of Nature, John Krebs, head of the National Environmental Research Center. Fiona admits to being a wildcard candidate, but she got the job as head of Science Media Center at the Royal Institution. Her adventure in the world of science had begun albeit with a salary that was £10,000 less than advertised because she did not have a PhD. In 2022, Fiona published a book called Beyond the Hype. I have it here with me. In which she told the story of recent national science controversies handled by the Science Media Centre. The first topic that Fiona covered was genetically modified food. There was a lobby of people who were totally opposed to any testing of genetically modified crops. On the other hand, scientists were working on drought and disease resistant crops to answer many problems such as world starvation. How then could journalists tell the story of GM from the viewpoint of the scientists to show that trials on the technique should be carried out? The SMC and Fiona worked hard to get experts in the field to talk to journalists to calm the debate so that scientific results could be reported accurately. One theme of the book is science debates which become polarized and toxic, with the truth becoming a casualty. One such subject is the bitter row over ME, or chronic fatigue syndrome. A group of activists were campaigning against scientific evidence which seemed to show that psychological treatments like cognitive behaviour therapy can help some patients to manage symptoms or even recover. Fiona argues in the book that when diseases are not fully understood, it is important to explore all possible scientific approaches, including biological and behavioural. She concludes that it will be patients who lose out if we stop all avenues of research. Fiona was raised a Catholic, and the next topic brought her into direct conflict with the beliefs of the Catholic Church. The subject was the production of human-animal hybrid cells for research into Parkinson's disease, spinal injuries, and motor neuron disease. The government was swayed by the pro-life campaign and announced that the use of animal, uh, animal hybrid cells was going to be banned by law. However, Fiona and the SMC brought the scientists doing this work and journalists together, 
and openly explained and demonstrated the importance of the topic. This time, reasoned arguments won the day, and the government did a major U-turn to allow the research to continue. Newspaper editorials wrote about how scientists had finally, finally found their voice. Many credited Fiona and the SMC with this change of culture, which saw scientists boldly engaging the media in contrast to previous debates on GM and designer babies. Other stories covered in the book are media, uh, the media response to the sacking of a government drugs advisor when he published a paper contradicting government policy, the hacking of an email account of climate scientists at the University of East Anglia, and the accident at the Fukushima nuclear research plant in Japan. All these situations re required careful, informed, and calm reporting, where it is essential that journalists could obtain accurate information from the scientists involved. In Leicester, Fiona worked with our press officer, Arthur Mercer, to open our facilities for animal research to journalists for the first time in the UK, which proved that openness is the best policy when contra controversial research is taking place. The COVID-19 pandemic was a, a science story like no other. It was as if all other scientific journalism was a dress rehearsal for the global pandemic which affected all our lives. Fiona was working with her SMC team around the clock, seven days a week, coordinating a database of 3,000 leading scientists to advise journalists. The major government advisors were Sir Patrick Vallance, Professor Chris Whitty, along with the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies, or SAGE. Political decisions on mass testing, lockdown strategy, face masks, vaccine rollout, and the appearance of new mutated forms of the virus were said to be taken in accordance with the mantra, follow the science. But what was the science? Fiona and her SMC team provided information for journalists and broadcasters in the full range from tabloid newspapers to broadsheets and serious discussions on Radio 4 to the Jeremy Vine Show and LBC. In the middle of this maelstrom, Fiona's guiding principle was openness in the disclosure of information. Many journalists don't like reporting science, uh, reporting on the work of scientists, because by its very nature, scientists is full of uncertainty and disagreement. Over the past 20 years, Fiona Fox and the Science Medium Center have brought clarity to the public communication of science on many of the most important topics facing our country today. Fiona has received many awards, including Honorary Fellow of the Royal Society and an OBE. Amazing scientific achievements for a Welsh girl from an Irish family with a degree in journalism and a supporter of Celtic Football Club. Mr. President and Vice-Chancellor, I present Fiona Fox, that you may confer upon her the honorary degree of Doctor of Science. Many people these days talk about what universities are for. Standing here today, the obvious one is the role that universities play in helping young people to further your education, to study a subject that you love, and then use that learning to embark on your new lives. I am so, so happy to be here today to share your special day, and I wish you all the best with your new adventures. That I am standing here receiving this honor shows the other side of universities, a side that sometimes gets neglected, but is arguably more important than ever. That's the role of universities in doing scientific research and in sharing that knowledge and expertise with society. I am especially proud to be honored by Leicester today because I believe it's one of the UK universities that recognizes the importance of communicating scientific research 
to the wider public. At a time when debates are so often quickly polarized and culture wars are ranging all around us, we need to hear the calm, measured, and accurate voices of our scientific experts more than ever. From climate change to ultra-processed foods, from vaping to vaccines, from screen time to mental health, we need the public and policymakers to have easy access to those people in society who have been trained to put aside opinions and biases and generate rigorous, impartial and accurate evidence that can help us all to make good decisions. But science communication does not happen by magic. Scientists need support, encouragement and guidance to navigate the ever-changing media landscape. That means universities investing in and protecting the space for science press officers and communicators. Too many universities and organizations have lost sight of the importance of this role. Some now consider marketing and brand reputation as much more important than communicating new research and are not giving enough support to scientists to enter the big societal debates. Just this week, a court in New Zealand found the university guilty of not providing enough support to a leading researcher who had been harassed on social media for sharing her expertise on COVID-19 with the media and the public. The court ruled that sharing knowledge like this in the midst of a pandemic was indeed part of her role as a university employee. And as such, she had the right to expect support and encouragement from her university. As was said some years ago, Leicester University won several prestigious awards for being open about its use of animals in medical research. This research had directly contributed to medical advances from Leicester that we now take for granted in heart disease, in diabetes, asthma, and much more. At a time when other universities were actively hiding their animal research, Leicester organized an event to launch a new medical research facility containing mice and rats and opened the doors to local journalists and politicians. It was unprecedented. The event led to glowing editorials in local papers praising the university for being so open and transparent on a controversial area of science. It even featured on the Today programme. This was honest and open science communication at its very best. And several years on, many of the other universities have now followed in Leicester's footsteps. So thank you so much to Leicester for awarding this honorary degree, honorary doctorate to, to me, to a science communicator, and for championing the importance of science communication in the daily work of this university.